I'm Kevin Trumbull with School of Materials Engineering. I'm here representing uh, Department Head uh, Dave Barr, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, Professor Maria Okanuski. Um, she is an Associate Professor of Materials Engineering, and she also has a courtesy appointment in uh, nuclear engineering. She's a fellow West Michigander. We actually grew up about 50 miles <laughs> apart from each other. So um, she did her graduate work at the University of Illinois, and uh, she joined us here from uh, Idaho National Labs. Um, she's an expert in uh, nuclear uh, materials and also in structural materials and their characterization at the microstructure level. So um, I'll let her tell you more about that. So she's made great contributions uh, to our teaching programs, uh, both at the graduate and undergraduate level. When our longtime professor, Dan Onda, retired a few years ago, uh, she kind of took over the quantitative microstructure analysis course that's been a a Purdue uh, uh, a mainstay for many, many years, and she's done a great job with the undergraduate uh, laboratory courses as well. She's remarkable, had a remarkable number of undergraduate researchers in her labs over the years, so I'll let her take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today, and thank you all for coming. Um, okay, so with that, I will go ahead and get started. And so first of all, as I've embarked upon this journey here, I firstly and foremostly need to thank my family and friend support along the way. And... Um, in the center here, I don't know if the, yeah, the pointer is quite weak, that is, uh, that's my parents there. And um, they've given me this backbone of um, basically um, hard work and perseverance and enabling me to pursue any sort of uh, research um, or discipline that I was particularly interested in. They didn't push me one way or another, so I really appreciated that. Um, and you'll see, I had a very non-linear trajectory, and you'll see how that kind of comes into play. I also have two sisters and a younger brother, too, that also um, supported me quite a bit along the way. And um, I have four nephews that, as you can maybe see at the bottom there, I'm trying to recruit them to come to Purdue. I start, I'm starting them very early. <laughs> and... Um, and then also I have a couple wonderful brother-in-laws and, um, of course, my husband here. He's also an associate professor and associate dean in the College of Health and Human Sciences. Um, he's actually taking his group out to lunch today, so he couldn't be here. Um, but at any rate, um, he's been a, a tremendous support to me. And then, of course, um, our dogs. Those are you know, near and dear to our hearts and uh, great emotional support animals, <laughs> if you will. So... Okay, so um, I included this picture here because, uh, not just because it's pretty. One, I'm an avid scuba diver. I, I love scuba diving. I'm a rescue, certified rescue diver. Uh, but it also represents my uh, trajectory, if you will, throughout my academic career. And um, the reason I chose uh, scuba diving, too, here to indicate that is you really have to be able to control yourself in three dimensions. I was not even on a linear sort of trajectory, right? I was, I was actually going in multi-dimensions. And you need that sort of buoyancy control for you to navigate around those coral heads effectively and actually see the, the macro and the microfauna and flora. Okay, so I started out as actually a marine science and biology uh, major. That was my bachelor's degree. So here's where I'm talking about nonlinearity, right? A very non-traditional path. Um, I conducted uh, this, my bachelor's degree at the University of Tampa, right in the heart of Tampa. Uh, it's a beautiful campus uh, right along the Hillsborough River there. And um, my research interest was, was really peaked from the very beginning. Um, I conducted research for four years with a faculty member, um, Stan Rice, and we um, were looking at barnacle colonization rates and adhesion strengths on various materials that um, the Navy had contracted him for. So we didn't know what they were. It was like material X, material Y, and whatnot. So I had to publish, um, or I, had, I had published a, a four-year thesis and um, 
also gave a presentation, and so it was like material X, material Y, material Z, because we never knew what they were doing the comparisons. But at any rate, he had developed this sort of clever um, methodology to measure adhesion strength of materials, and he called it, uh, for the barnacles, a barnacleometer, naturally, right? So every, every week we would head out to, I have the picture um, at the very bottom there of Davis Island, um, and we would go and count the barnacles, bring them back, and then check their adhesion strength, right, and chart that over um, four years, essentially. So one of the other things, too, that I'm passionate about is also um, preserving the environment. And so one of the things that I did as an undergrad was started the recycling program at the University of Tampa. Um, so that's uh, me down there, and yeah, that's black and white. I guess that's what it looks like uh, after you get the scanned in version. Um, they did have color photos then. So, um, but yeah, I actually dug this out last night. So, um, but at any rate, um, we actually had the president of the university out there helping paint some of these um, bins that we were doing our um, paper recycling in. So it was, it was a great effort across the university. Okay. So now to the nonlinearity. I have this jump right between my undergraduate and graduate experience. So now you see I'm pursuing my master's and PhD in nuclear engineering. Well, this had to do because with I had uh, four years basically where I took um, some time and worked in basically water quality testing and R&D. And in the R&D component, um, I had the opportunity to interact with a um, a National Laboratory Fellow, the highest sort of echelon you can achieve at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And he was my mentor. He really, um, he really kind of was a sort of a guidepost, if you will, for nuclear, right? He um, really showed me how interesting this could be. Um, and then one of our other collaborators as part of the small R&D company too was from UIUC and he recruited me to come to graduate school and so there I was. Um, so I had a couple years to catch up on engineering classes, so I took longer than most students, and so it was kind of an interesting endeavor, but I was, I was determined to do that. And I started out in my master's actually doing, um, actually, simulations, right, which I'm an experimentalist, right, so you saw, right, the barnacles and whatnot. So, but that's what we have funding for. So um, it really opened my eyes to the simulation, um, the capabilities of simulation, but also gave me a deeper understanding of what was happening from the microstructural level that I could then apply to my PhD. So my PhD transitioned more to experimental work where I'm looking at um, microstructural um, evolution that was a radiation induced in um, basically single crystal iron with and without helium to simulate different types of nuclear reactor regimes. Okay. So, um, so those those really kind of set the the um, backbone for where I am now today. And I also wanted to um, thank um, a number of different collaborators from Los Alamos, Argonne, SCKC, and Washington State. And also, I was a charter member of the World Nuclear University too. So I, I traveled actually all over the world to conduct experiments at those entities. Okay. So. Um, so that took me to um, Idaho National Lab, which is the, or which is the United States only um, fully funded DOE, any nuclear energy laboratory. And um, I became directly as a staff member. I was not a postdoc. I was directly hired as a staff member because I came in with previous existing experience too. Um, and they really gave me a lot of freedom, allowed me to, um, expand upon my interest in, in different realms. But because uh, they were a nuclear, nuclear laboratory, they had a lot of uh, fuel-based research. So then I started um, turning my attention more to fuel-based research as opposed to structural and some of the waste materials that I was um, looking at in my master's and my PhD. So um, I worked on understanding connections between microstructure of nuclear materials and fuels and their mechanical properties. So this is an example of just uh, optimizing some mechanical properties in a triso surrogate fuel. 
This is an example of looking at uh, different types of fabrication methodologies and optimizing residual stress in uranium molybdenum fuel. And one of the things that's really advantageous about being at Idaho National Lab is you can see in the top uh, left-hand corner there, that's the advanced test reactor looking down into the core. So you see that Cherenkov radiation there. Um, so it is the most, um, or is the largest reactor that we can use to test materials in the United States. And so that opened a lot of capabilities for me to propose different types of experiments to, um, that were not available before. And by the way, these are extremely expensive, so you need the sort of support, right, at these, these national labs. They also have amazing fuel handling facilities because this stuff comes out of the reactor and it is hot. Right? I can't just reach over and touch it. Not physically hot, but radioactively hot. So we need to work in these sorts of hot cells that are shown here. That's, that's pretty unique to Idaho National Lab, too. And then finally, there was um, nuclearization of some of the different uh, types of techniques, um, meaning they were shielded, for instance. We could use electron microscopes or focused ion beam um, combined with an SEM to enable us to pull out some really, really small specimens that we can then take to some of the user facilities. They became, now they weren't as hot, right? They were um, below the thresholds that needed to be accommodated within the particular um, user facilities, for instance, at Brookhaven, at uh, the advanced photon source at Argonne. Okay. So, um, so we continue here. This was kind of setting up some of the, the work that I've done here at Idaho, and also continuing, uh, my graduate students now have picked up some of the work that I've laid the foundation for at INL. Because it takes a long time to actually design these experiments, the irradiation experiments, to actually being able to characterize them. Sometimes a couple years, sometimes a decade, sometimes multiple decades. So this fuel down here that I show at the bottom, it's uranium zirconium fuel. That's nearly 30 years old now. That was my first PhD student that looked at that. So, and that was so hot, right? That was the coolest sample they let us remove from the hot cell to provide perspective. So now how did I make this sort of transition between Idaho National Lab and deciding to come to Purdue? So I had had a lot of people throughout my career say, oh, maybe you should become a faculty member, right? And I was like, no, I love the National Labs. At that point, I'd worked in over a half a dozen of them across the world. And I really liked um, you know, my, my, my position and my flexibility at Idaho National Lab. But I never lost that student engagement. As soon as I started there, I was working with universities, working with graduate students um, from a number of different entities. By the way, one of, one of these students is probably one of my closest collaborators right now, interestingly. And then I also decided, okay, I'm going to try my hand at course development and teaching. So I worked with one of my collaborators um, at INL, and we co-developed a course on nuclear materials, too. So that allowed me to really kind of test the waters, and the opportunity presented itself. And so my husband and I came here to Purdue University, and I started as an assistant professor in 2016. Um, and as I mentioned, we were laying that sort of foundational work to enable my graduate, my current graduate students and recently graduated graduate students to be able to continue to pursue some of the uh, microstructural evolution studies of these nuclear fuels, for instance. So um, on the right-hand side here, we see this sort of 3D phase of void evolution in neutron irradiated zircon uranium zirconium fuel. So this was something where we took those little tiny cubes, those 50 by 50 micron cubes I showed you that were pulled out by a focused ion beam. They were cool enough now we could take them to APS at Argonne and then do some tomographic imaging. This provided unprecedented insight into the three-dimensional microstructure that was never known. We had no idea the complexity of these systems until we could take a peek three-dimensionally. So, um, Argonne also liked that. That actually ended up on their front page of their website. And so we were pretty proud of that. That was my first graduate student, Genova Thomas. Um, and so those different colors there indicate the different phases as well as the different, um, the porosity that's present within those fuels. 
One of the other kind of uh, cool things that we were able to do because we had access to neutrons, right, these nuclear reactors, is this 4D, I'll call it quasi 4D microstructural evolution. We were able to examine the same microstructure before and after it was actually neutron irradiated. Pretty darn hard to do because you're trying to do this years apart, you have to have appropriate fiducials and think you can get back to that same point. So that provided us some insight too in terms of how precipitates can evolve in structural materials. And it's a much more complex again than we initially thought in terms of we have nucleation and growth, we have basically shrinkage and dissolution, we have ballistic dissolution from um, the bombardment of the neutrons and growth and reprecipitation. So, um, and then finally, this is a, an ongoing project, if you will. One of the other things I'm highlighting is the uranium zirconium phase diagram. So we think, oh yeah, phase diagrams, that's easy, right? We know all of these. No, we don't. We, we realized <laughs> nobody agrees on the uranium zirconium phase diagram. And so we have um, been doing some in situ neutron diffraction at Los Alamos and um, one of my recent PhD students um, conducted some, some of these experiments and we're collaborating also with Edwin Garcia in MSC to do machine learning. And now we've come up with a new phase diagram. I didn't put it here because it's not published yet, so. <laughs> um, but that's coming out soon. So um, all of these entities here, I'd just like to thank them because those are important user facilities that we go to and conduct our research at. And then, um, Learning and engagement, so as Kevin mentioned, um, I've taught a number of different courses here and um, ranging basically from our intro class, which is shown here on this left-hand side. In interestingly, that was um, understanding the connections between uh, processing and microstructure of ice cream. So this was actually the first um, lecture that uh, previous um, Dean Meng Chang actually came to. Uh, he wasn't, he was a little too busy to stay around and wait for the ice cream though. <laughs> so, but at least he came, so it was pretty exciting. Um, and then this is actually, this is a class that uh, Kevin was just mentioning in terms of the micro quantitative microstructural analysis. I created a, a kind of a fun exercise where students are actually using um, ASTM methodology to determine volume fraction of phases and they get to use candy bars and so we do that right around Halloween so it's a, a nice appropriate kind of combination. Um, and then just this is just an example of one of the lab courses that I, I've taught too. The students get to drive their own SEM and, um, and then of course here's my little puppy helping write lectures. I mean he is named after Otto Hahn so naturally he's going to help write the lectures right. So, and then for engagement, um, these are some of the ongoing things that I currently have right now. I'm the chair of the user group of the Nuclear Science User Facility. I'm on the user's executive committee for um, NSLS2 at Brookhaven, um, for ANS, and the Material Science Technology Division Executive Committee, and MINES, which is coming up in about um, a week and a half is I'm the, the co-technical um, co chair there too, and I'll be the chair in four years. So, um, and then finally, this is just um, snapshots of our research group, kind of in combination of doing research and fun things, we like to combine both. I've, that is a, um, a much nicer environment, of course, to work within. And, um, and the other thing I was gonna mention too is there's a combination of both undergrads and graduate students uh, shown here. Okay, and then my current grad research group, um, actually are all these ladies here, they're all in the audience, so thank you all for coming. And um, then Nate is gonna be joining us in uh, January, but um, I, I do want to um, basically to echo the sentiments of uh, the previous faculty member too, the graduate students and the undergraduates are the ones that do all the work. So thank you all for your hard work. Thank you to those that have already um, graduated and moved on to other, um, other jobs. So, and as you can see, many of them are um, fellows, various types of fellows, Fulbright, UNLP, um, um, NSF, for instance, and have won some other accolades as well. So they're very successful. 
And then finally, um, my mentors and funding agencies, I'd like to thank them. So this is um, Dr. Rice. He was my barnacleometer developer. <laughs> And then uh, Dr. Ron Brodzinski, he unfortunately has since passed away, but he was my real inspiration into getting into nuclear engineering. And then uh, Professor Miley recruited me to UIUC, my PhD advisor, Jim Stubbins, who I can always just knock on his door, or email him, and he's, he's an excellent resource for me, Stumaloy Los Alamos. And then also Elliot um, and Leah, who are my mentors here. So thank you all for um, supporting me. And then finally, of course, I have to thank all my funding agencies too, because we obviously need our funding to support our students. And with that, um, I thank you all for coming, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Still on? Any questions? I have two questions. Okay. Uh, the first one is uh, so from uh, like marine biology type of major into nuclear engineering, the backgrounds are very different. What is the hardest thing you face? You face that to go through the transition successfully. Right. I think the hardest thing was I mentioned I spent four years, right, out of, you know, academia and getting back into the, the, um, the rigorous study regime um, was probably the most difficult aspect. My, my math was, was very strong, you know, so, so, but it still took a little bit of time to basically transition back in. Um, so, so, yeah, it was just readapting and rebalancing my life. Um, so, yeah. Sure. Yeah, the, uh, the next question is a more technical side. How do you keep the ice cream microstructure stable when you're under the microscope? How do you keep it stable? It takes you time put it in to, a freezer. to see it, right? <laughs> <laughs> So this one, they cheated. Basically, they had used liquid nitrogen, too, right, to cool ah, the okay. system. So I think you could see the doer that was, like, sitting on the floor. I don't think I cropped that part out. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, hello, Professor Maria, and uh, first of all, congratulations to all your achievements. Uh, as you stated, you had your majors as marine science in your uh, a bachelor's, and then you s you switched over to nuclear engineering, or uh, like atomic physics, during your uh, PhD and your master's. Mm -hmm. So, again, like uh, as stated before, this is like a... a this is a dangerous transition, if I was in your position, but you took that jump fearlessly, so, but <laughs> what made you uh, realize that, okay, you already took a jump, what made you realize that, okay, nuclear physics is going to be my forte, and I'm going to build a career out of this? I mean, what prompted you not to take another jump, is my question. Like, why did you stick on to nuclear physics? Okay, this is going to be, this is going to be my main, domain from now onwards? So thank you for the question. Um, so it's a, it's a great question, right? Because it is a bit about finding out what resonates with, within ourselves in terms of our interests, right? And um, for me, it was a stepwise process, too, in terms of, OK, well, I'm going to get my master's first, see what, you know, see what this is like, see if, see if this fit is right for me, right? And you can see, right, I transitioned, too, from the modeling to the experimental side back to, you know, my, my true self as an experimentalist. Um, so, um, but I, like I said, I just kind of took it in a stepwise process. And by the way, for nuclear engineering, we had to complete a master's and then a PhD. There was no fast track to a PhD either. So it also gives people the opportunity to develop, you know, their skills and their interests, too. So. I think we're ready to move on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.